What's up guys? So, quick Q&A. Uh, I'm going to continue the series here. Sorry if the quality is not the greatest. I'm going to do this live so that we can uh, get it all set to go. Um, and it's already put up through if there for you, so sorry if the phone is buzzing. But I wanted to get it up um, easier for you. Quick things. Uh, links below for all the discounts and things. Uh, if you're on the watching the video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. Um, apparel and everything's down in the link, the subscription or the comment section below as well. So let's get started. We're going to do a couple different uh, questions here. Okay, so first question. <clears throat> what would be a good weight rod for panfish, trout, and small pike or carp? Big difference because a lot of the stuff that you're going to be using, the flies, are going to be different sizes. So if you want a rod for panfish, trout, and carp, I would probably suggest a five or a six weight. It's going to be a little heavy for panfish and for small trout. It's going to be a little light for pike because you're going to want to throw bigger flies. Unfortunately, that's going to be uh, it's going to be you're going to have to you know give and take a little bit for different things. Hello to all people who are on the stream, Polly. What's going on, Rory? It's nice to see you. Okay. Um, another question: What is the easiest way to get free lures? Well, you need to provide service or representation. Uh, and goods or goods to individuals who provide those. Getting free stuff doesn't exist. It's about time spent putting in the effort to make sure that you are providing a service, goods, or value to companies. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. What's the best fly rod weight for bass, trout, pike, and muskie? You're on a little better track. It's kind of just shifting a little bit, though. Um, so for bass, trout, trout's going to be your lowest end, so probably four or five weight. Um, bass, probably a five, six, maybe seven weight. Um, see you, Polly. Sorry that your boss caught you on your phone. Uh, pike and musky are going to be a little higher because you're going to be throwing larger flies as well. So that's going to be anywhere from six, seven, eight, nine weight. Okay? Um, so... Average those out, and if you want to give it a shot, you're going to be fishing a really heavy trout rod or a really light musky rod. Um, should I really worry about keeping different water columns in the back of my mind at all times of the day or only certain times? That's dependent. You need to be obs you know, observant about what's going on uh, in your water. Now, if, I, if you're fishing a really small stream, your water column depth probably isn't going to vary that you know, drastically. You, in fact, for example, in New York, you can fish three hooks at any given point um, where I guide clients. So what I would suggest is you, you flip up or you cast up, and if you have a fly that's in any given water column, you're going to be covering that, especially, you know, every water column. Especially keep in mind that if you, if you cover all the life cycles of the, fl of the bugs that you're finding under rocks or that you're seeing land or, or you know, spinners on the in spent spinners, um, then you're probably going to be in a, in a good place. But uh, I did a video on choosing flies. My suggestion is if you're fishing big water, you have to be ultra observant. You have to make sure that, um, don't be afraid to, to try new flies. <clears throat> At any given point, the, the feeding cycle, the feeding uh, habits of fish will change. And so I'm not saying that to scare you, but be, be flexible and open to changing. I would also not rig your, your rod before you get to the water. Don't parking lot or trunk rig, as we call it sometimes. You're going to want to get down there and see what it is you need to do and, to be successful. But yes, I would always keep the, where, where those fish will be in the water column in the back of your mind. Unless you, you want to go out and you just want to you know, fish for dry flies or fish nymphs or this, that, you know, or streamers. Sometimes guys just want to, are, are done with the bug game and want to fish streamers only. That's fine. Just know that you're going to be not, you're not going to be addressing certain fish. Um, let's see. What would be the ideal rod and style of the real style to go for for multi-purpose species? Should I go with spinning rod, bait caster, fly setup? What uh, types of baits or flies should I focus on obtaining at first for such a large variety of fish, meaning rainbow trout, bluegill, crappie, bass, catfish, carp, salmon? <clears throat> okay, first question would be spinning rod, bait caster, fly. That's going to be up to you. Okay, that's going to be preference. I own all those things, and if I want to go specifically for bass, and I know that I want, I'm going to be fishing big, deep water, I can fish it with a fly, but I prefer, especially when my other buddies are just fishing with bait casters and spinning reels, I'll bring my rigs. 
not my fly rigs, I'll bring my, my conventional setup. Why? Because I don't want to be the only guy getting in their way. But if I'm going with my guys, you know, with, with buddies who will, will love fly fishing, they understand that, you know, we're going to be winging some stuff around. Um, that being said, there are a couple flies that will <clears throat> kind of work for all of those. I would say, for example, a fly, a woolly bugger will work um, for trout, bluegill, crappie, bass, catfish, carp, especially with a, with a bead head jigging on the bottom, salmon, um, you know, something in a chartreuse or black, brown, purple, pink sometimes. Um, I would also say on the other side, the conventional side, typically um, Senko or Ned rigs work well for all of these as well. Um, with the exception of maybe salmon. But I've heard of people catching salmon on worms as well. So live bait works all, on all of them. Woolly buggers, um, stone flies, and sometimes uh, crayfish imitations work well for uh, for all of these as well. With the exception of sometimes salmon, spawning salmon, don't want to tick. Um, <clears throat> I would say focus primarily, pick, pick either warm water or cold water just to start, or trout and bass. Those have heavy overlap too, panfish and trout as well. Um, when you get into specialized stuff like carp, salmon, catfish, you, you're going to have to acquire some different stuff too, okay? Um, I would just be uh, be weary that you're probably going to have to buy more if you want to expand that repertoire, okay? Um, as a noob, no, I already answered that. What's the best all-around bass rod? Now, if, I'm, if we're going to refer to um, conventional tackle uh, specifically, I would probably say a medium, medium heavy, I would say medium heavy fast action, uh, you know, rod. Because um, I, I like, I can jig with it. I can, um, you can fish crankbaits with it. You can basically do anything you need to with it. Maybe like a six, six, seven foot, depending on how tall you are. Um, if you're just starting out, if, if you're saying that, if you're asking that question because you need one rod, then go, I wouldn't spend all your money on a rod, personally. I would have a nice reel, I would have a variety of tackle that works, and I would just put in the time and effort to learn the tactics and techniques first before spending a bunch of money. And uh, there are a couple questions here. I'm going to answer the questions for those of you who are live. Let's see here. Let's see if I can do this. Here we go. How to fly fish in winter? I always end up catching nothing. My my recommendation is um, find pools, uh, low and slow, fish fish midges, maybe egg sucking leech. Um, in this in this early winter, you can still get away with some eggs sometimes. Um, low and slow, feel the bottom ticks. I like the Euro nymph in this way um, because I can feel like a fishing drop offs into holes. I can feel the bottom the entire way, and I can see very subtle ticks because winter. Uh, the fish aren't going to go out of their way to smash something, so make sure that you're able to feel subtle ticks. I like to Euro Nymph for that reason, and I have a video on that uh, that I, I think it was from last year, but it's still relevant now. How do you reach out to potential sponsors? Um, first of all, like I said a little bit here, a um, little ago, a little bit ago, I definitely think that you need to offer value. Okay, for example, I have a clothing line. The people that I send clothing to have larger followings than I do. Reason being is because if you want to reach potential audience, this person that has that audience is of value. I also take a look at um, what kind of person they are. Do they use profanity on their on their stuff? They, you have to be brand friendly. And so if I, if I don't swear frequently, nor do I ever hardly ever swear on the channel. And so even when I'm frustrated, and so whenever I whenever I can demonstrate that I'm I'm valuable, I have a, have a following that that would would respond to the products that they want to show, then that's where the conversation can start. But before I even attempt to reach out to anyone, or they attempt to reach out to me, um, there has to be that connection and understanding that we're going to benefit one another first. So work yourself. It took me quite a bit of quite a few funds. You know, I, it was very expensive to start. Um, I would definitely make sure that you are putting forth your best foot and making sure that you're demonstrating that you're valuable to that company first. Another question here. Oh, sorry. Um, 
Do you ever float fish beads? I do not. However, I do. And this is what I mean. I utilize this product called um, Soft Milking Eggs by uh, Otters. And um, they are technically a soft plastic. Okay, they're like a little rubbery, soft plastic, spherical shape that one could call a bead or one could call something else. But I tie it, like I, I actually go on, a, on an egg hook, like an egg hook short shank, 2x strong, and tie a thread base, usually like a little clear and then an orange bead in the middle, like a ball, and then I slide that on there and then I anchor with glue. You could call it a fly, you could call it not, and I put a little veil on it. So I would consider it a fly uh, or a bead. But I do not put the bead mid uh, mid line with a hook at the bottom. To me, that's not something that I I'm not going to knock anyone who does it that way. It's just not the fish. The fish is not eating the hook, and therefore I'm not for it. But then again, people could argue one way or another. I'm not going to get into semantics. I don't fish beads. I don't. I know it works for many people, but <clears throat> I I like to fish. The, the, the bead or the, the ball or the egg right on the fly itself, if that makes any sense. Okay? Um, but it's very, very uh, successful, that, that setup. Uh, we'll do a couple more here. Tips for steelhead fishing. Um, there's a big difference between fishing at the Great Lakes and fishing over in the Pacific Northwest. So when you're fishing for steelhead in the Great Lakes, it's, a, it's very rocky. It's very um, tight quarters. And so, one thing I will mention is know your angler etiquette and be safe and weary of others, okay? Um, when you hook into a fish, if, if it's a subtle take and it's just dipping a little bit, let people around you know because the fish might take off. But if that, ream, or that reel screams, um, just you know, let them know fish on and then that way they can either bring their gear in or take precaution because the last thing you want is all your stuff tangling up around others. Um, my suggestion would be to fish low and slow and make sure you're feeling every bo the bottom, make sure you're able to look for subtle takes and if you're fishing in the Great Lakes the mouths of the steelhead are much harder so you need a really sharp hook and a little more of a set. You don't have to rip you know the, the, the hook through the fish but a nice little hard pop set works, um, whereas in the Pacific Northwest, most of those guys swing streamers. Okay, so they'll they'll cast across, or they'll even spay cast across, which I might experiment with a little bit here, uh, even in still water. But and then they'll they'll let it swing, and the fish usually sets itself. In the Great Lakes, because we're nymphing usually, or we'll, we're, we're uh, tight line euro or indicator nymphing, um, you have to watch and set the hook yourself. It's just a little different. But I would suggest if you're fishing here and you're fishing with nymphs or beads or whatever, fish low and slow. Um, I would suggest varying your colors at first and then honing in once you're finding subtle takes or strikes. Um, when, you're, when you're swinging for fish, um, cover water. You have to find fish. Cover water. Okay? So uh, I have a video on how to swing for, for steelhead actually from last year also, so check that out. I'll do one or two more questions here. <clears throat> See, when fishing in the den of winter, what do you wear as a base layer? You're kind of bringing us, you're the king of bringing us cheap quality reviews. What's the cost of fishing base layer compared to cost? All right, so <clears throat> here's, so there's, there's a couple ways to go about this. As far as a base layer goes, base layer, layer goes, um, it's really hard to beat like a, like a, you can go and buy it like TJ Maxx or, which is, you know, or, or a Marshall's. Or at Walmart, you can buy thermal, you know, thermal base layers. It's kind of hard to beat the old school thermal base layers if you prepare your upper and outer layers um, with with water wicking or, or moisture preventative materials. So you can go with cotton underneath, or you can go with um, uh, what's it called? Uh, um, I'm sorry, it's flannel. Okay, you can go with flannel. So like, if you can go with a really thin compression, like a cheap compression shirt. Or, and bottoms, you know, and then a, th uh, a flannel <clears throat> that usually does pretty well if you're going to protect, if you're going to use um, waders, like chest waders, and then a waterproof jacket. Um, and then my second medium bait, you know, middle layer 
uh, is usually always is merino wool. Uh, it when it gets wet, it stays dry, and it all, and it stays warm. Or sorry, when it gets wet, it stays dry. When it gets wet, it stays warm, um, <clears throat> and it the new materials are actually extremely thin and still provide great uh, wicker wicking moisture um, or wicking material properties. And then I go with a and if it's super super cold, uh, like you said, dead of winter. Uh, I tend to stick with five millimeter um, neoprene waders, or if you're going to go with breathable waders, you can get insulated breathable waders as well, and then quality boots. <clears throat> the key, though, is to keep your hands, your nose, your ears, and your head warm. And having a quality outer layer, both in waders and in a jacket, is key. And um, I sometimes will what I'm doing if, if I'm swinging, especially if I'm swinging, I'll have like a hand muff. You know, like one of the ones where you can wear around your waist and you can put kind of like like this. <clears throat> and then I'll have my rod under my, my armpit here and I'll kind of brace it like this. And as it swings, it swings. And then when I have to make another cast, I'll take my step and then I'll, I'll cast or single head cast, you know. But if I'm nymphing, I'll have one in here, one in here, and I'll brace it. And my outer hand, <clears throat> because it's working, it usually doesn't get super cold, but I will wear either neoprene glove or I'll wear a wool glove with a leather palm, um, especially if the rod's going to get cold. Uh, what else? Um, and then my jacket, I usually have a really nice, some kind of jacket. It doesn't have to be expensive. Um, I'm not sponsored by the company, but mountainwarehouse.com or .us. They have an UK and a US based operation, but that stuff is awesome and it's cost efficient and it's tough. So mountainwarehouse.uk or mountainwarehouse.com or U.S. <clears throat> Great stuff. Uh, I'm pretty sure if you live in the Erie, Pennsylvania area, down in that Grove City Outlets, um, there they have an, an actual store, and I think they're across the U.S. as well. But waterproof, tough uh, material covering your your waders, and you really can't go wrong. I would also make I would also suggest wearing some kind of buff or um, gaiter or or like some really wool hat just because if your ears get cold your hands get cold your toes get cold merino wool socks then you're not having a great time okay if you guys have any more that's it, that's it for the q a for today uh, if you do have any more questions please leave them in the comments below and i will be sure to either include them in the next q a or respond to them immediately when i see them okay so i appreciate you guys make sure you share the video give a thumbs up and uh subscribe to the channel Make sure you check out the other videos in the playlist, and I really appreciate you guys. Without you guys, this channel would be absolutely nothing, and I really appreciate that. So, love you guys. Catch you guys on the flip side. Tight lines.